Evening on Nationwide, remembering those who left the Northwest to fight in the First World War. 100 years on, we hear some of their stories. We find out about the battles fought and how those who died were forgotten and how those who survived kept a low profile in the community. Tomorrow is Armistice Day, when on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, the guns fell silent on mainland Europe, marking the end of the First World War. Now, during the four years of the war, some 16 million people died and more than 30 million were injured. Here in Ireland, young men left from virtually every parish in the country to join the war effort, and it's estimated that well over 35,000 of them never returned to their homeland. This evening, we're focusing on those from the northwest who went to war, and we're in Raffo in County Donegal, where our reporter Mary Hart has been looking at the impact of World War I on this locality. Like so many towns and villages across Ireland, Raffo has a story to tell. A story of a place a century ago that was robbed of its youth and where a deep sadness has remained with families to this very day. They left in the full flush of youth to be plunged into the horrors of war. So aptly described by Donegal poet Patrick McGill from the trenches. Before I joined the army, I loved in Donegal where every night the fairies would hold their carnival. But now I'm out in Flanders, where men like wheat ears fall, and it's death and not the fairies which is holding carnival. On the first morning of the Battle of the Somme, seven men from this small town alone perished. Dozens more would never make it home. For decades, the dead of World War I remained unacknowledged by the Irish government. Donegal was the first county in Ireland to publish a book of honour listing the names of the fallen parish by parish. For County Donegal we're very fortunate that we do have the book of honour and it lists all of the men from Donegal who died during the First World War and for Raffo in particular there are 42 people who died during the First World War. Raffo is, is kind of like a microcosm of the rest of Donegal uh, the men who enlisted from Raffo came from both communities, they were both Catholic and Protestant. They came from all backgrounds. Uh, they would have been farmers, labourers, shopkeepers. Um, they also enlisted both locally, which is interesting, and in countries further away. A lot of the time their bodies were never found. So they're remembered on memorials right across uh, the battle sites. Uh, for instance, the Thiepville Memorial, the Men in Gate, uh, Tyne Cop Memorial. There were memorials built, but primarily they were erected in the Protestant churches, in the Church of Ireland and Presbyterian churches. There are no memorials, as far as I'm aware, in Catholic churches in Donegal. But there is one place where all 42 men are remembered. Shortly after the end of the war, trees were planted in their memory in the centre of the town. They're particularly poignant for twin sisters, who grew up in the diamond in a Catholic family. And he says one day, you know, we just have two uncles that went and died in the First World War and there's trees in the diamond and that just kind of... She always made us buy poppies. Yeah. Because, because of the war. And the trees in the diamond were... For the two uncles. Within the Catholic community, we were shunned, you know, and you didn't talk about it. But like, now it's changed and thank God it's changed. There's so much change and you can go out now and you can say it with pride that you did have somebody that died in the First World War. On St. Patrick's weekend in 2007, the sisters went to France in search of their uncle's grave. It was so amazing, wasn't it, Gary? It was brilliant. Uh, and me and Gary was very proud to be there just because we're the only ones Nobody else in our family has ever been there. For this programme, we went in search of a picture of a lost Donegal soldier that led to Belfast and a box that lay untouched in an attic for many years. Hello. Are you Harriet? Yes, I'm Harriet. Oh, Hi, I'm Mary. Hi. You're very Hi. welcome. Thank you. I believe you, you have some stuff I for me. A lot of stuff here for you. Thank you. Good morning. Okay, thanks. 
Harriet, what you have here is absolutely amazing. Well, that's Harry Taylor, my uncle. This is to certify that he went to Canada in 1913 and he joined up in 1915 into the Canadian Infantry. What's in this box? Oh, just wee bits and pieces. That are... Right, tell me what's in here. Now, that is his, uh, I think that's a cap badge, isn't it? Yep, uh-huh. It's a Canadian Highland, yeah. And that's his uh, number. That... Oh my goodness, that's his, that's his actual uh, dog uh, tag. And that's another one, of the 45th, that was his, that was his regiment. in Canada. And that's a button of his uniform. Oh, gosh. And this here, apparently, is for the times he was wounded. He was twice wounded, and that's why he had those stripes on his uniform. Right, so he was twice wounded, and yes, then he finally um, was killed. Yes, the 8th of August. 1918. 1918. This is what they call the penny. The penny. And anybody who was killed in the war got one of those there. What is most interesting as well for me, Harriet, is that you have all his letters home. So tell me what you have found. This one here now is was 1st of August 1916, where he was back in England after being wounded, and he was well enough. I am getting a 10-day pass, but I am sorry to say I can't get over to Ireland. Ireland is out of bounds for us. I am sure Mother will be disappointed. This was sent to my grandmother. This little, which she always wore. Oh, it's a cross, yeah. This cross is presented to you in memory of one who, in the Great War, died for his king and country. Well, I feel very proud of him, because having sons myself, and I feel very sorry for my grandmother. That's what she went through. She lost her husband. When she was only married a few years, and then her two sons away at the war. As centenary commemorations continue over the next four years, more and more communities across Ireland will begin remembering the fallen from their locality, as they have been doing here for several years at Fort Dunry on Donegal's most northerly coast. Remembrance is, of course, of the essence as we commemorate the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War. And in the years following the war, many towns and cities erected monuments to remember the local men who had died. Here in Derry in 1927, one such monument was unveiled in the Diamond, in the heart of the walled city. Now, over the years, this memorial became associated and became seen as a symbol of the Protestant loyalist community and, especially during the Troubles, it was often targeted for attack. However, recent research has revealed a hidden history at the Diamond War Memorial, which affects families right across what was once a deeply divided city of Derry, or as some of its citizens call it, Londonderry. History researcher Trevor Temple knows a great deal about this imposing and rather harrowing monument designed by English sculptor Vernon March. I think that Vernon March is trying to create the reality of war, the brutality of war, you know. So you have the aggressive image of the soldier with the bayonet, you have the sailor on the other side, and then above you have the, the figure of um, the angel of victory. And then you have um, like bronze plaques with the 756 names of people who has associations locally who died during the, the First World War. For Trevor, it was the columns of names that were the inspiration for the Diamond War Memorial project. I had this gut feeling when I was going through that there was a lot of Catholics, a lot of, there was almost an equal number of people who had, who had died from both the, the, the Protestant Unionist and the Catholic Nationalist communities. And, um, I thought it would be an interesting exercise to go through the, the names to see the kind of percentage. And when I did, I discovered that there were 52% of the names in the War Memorial were um, from Protestant Unionist background, and 48% roughly were from a Catholic Nationalist background. 
the war memorial was seen as something belonging to the Protestant Unionist community, you know. It was in the middle of the city, it was chained off, it was regularly paint bombed. When it all came out, there seemed to be a hunger within the Catholic community for this kind of knowledge about who these people were, people who had been neglected and forgotten about for years. And I think that they saw something, you know, here, this, this is a shared past, it became like a, a shared monument. The deaths and lives of those forgotten has gradually been revealed. Michael Doherty is involved with the city's Peace and Reconciliation organisation, through which a group of loyalists invited him on their trip to the World War I cemeteries. Little did he realise it would unearth a long-held family secret. The week before we left, I happened to be visiting my father, and I said to him, if we had somebody killed, uh, I could have looked it up because I'm going to Belgium. And he was sitting reading the Derry Journal that, on that particular night, and he looked across at me and he says, but sure you had, you had a great uncle who was killed in the First World War. And I said, what? He says, I, he says what had happened was he joined up and his father disowned him at that particular point in time and forbade the family ever, ever to speak about him again. Now, remember, I would understand that we would come from a very Republican type of a background. And this would have been a big issue in the family about somebody joining the British Army. With the help of Trevor Temple, Michael learnt that John Doherty died in France in January 1916 following the Battle of Luz. His body was never found. The Loyalists that were along with me, we actually couldn't find him because we were looking for a grave. We actually didn't know it was a panel. So we searched, searched and searched, and one of the Loyalists, actually, uh, the late Raymond Miller, uh, found it. He, I can remember, Maggie, it's here, it's here, it's here, I'm pointing up. Uh, and at that point, I ran down, and there's a photograph of me just pointing up to the actual name. Michael sketched this emotional journey in his notebook and found his own way of remembering. He went off to war and left his home to bring freedom to nations as a main goal. It was work and pay by the British Crown that a family disowned him as a traitor on him ever to frown. Most poignantly, John Doherty's mother, Sarah, could not let her son be forgotten. Possibly unknown to her family, she registered John's name for the soon-to-be-unveiled War Memorial. In St Columns Cathedral, regimental flags of the Great War still hang, and volumes record the names of those who died. It was this man, Lance Sergeant John Cairns, that brought Katrina Quigley, originally from the Catholic Bogside, into the Fountain Estate, a strong loyalist community in the city, to meet Garth Hepburn. It was actually my husband. I heard a programme on the radio, and it was about the Cathedral Youth Club. We're going out to France to go to the graves of the First World War. And so I got in contact with them and they invited me to come up here. So then they asked me if one of the boys could go and find my great-grandfather. And I was delighted. I think it didn't really come up until I actually brought everything out. And we started to read and then the address came up. And some of the boys says, where's that? And I says, that's Rosemount, over in the dairy side. And then I have also got his dog tag. And one of the boys was reading that and he says, is that his name? Is that his initials, RC? And I says, no, I says, that's Roman Catholic. When Katrina came in, no one thought about asking what religion she was. It was just, she needed somebody to go out and look for a good grandfather. Religion just wasn't brought into it at all, no matter what religion she is or was. So she told us it was in the Thiebel, so we searched the Thiebel for it. We actually found it on one of the big pillars inside the Thiebel Memorial. When I first seen it, I put a pop across down beside it and I stood for a moment of silence just out of respect. It gives me a whole different perspective on the full thing because before I would have just thought it was only Protestants that actually fought and died. So just my age from the other side of the community actually went out and fought, and you just have to give them the respect that they need for going out and doing that. 
John Cairns died in France in September 1916. He was 43 and a company commander of the 1st Battalion of the Royal Irish Volunteers, in which capacity the members held him in high esteem. I always knew, I always knew his name was on the Diamond Memorial. I was taken as a small child up and my daddy took me and my sister up and showed us that's your great-grandfather's name up there, like, and we always knew that. But then, I suppose we got older as well, and then the trouble started, and you just, you put things like that. I suppose you forget about them, because there was so much other stuff going on then, you know. It wasn't until we come through the other side then that you think, you start looking back at other memories. But I just always felt, I have to buy me Bobby. I haven't wore it, but I think after this I will. It's time to wear me Bobby. It is a complex part of our history which will take time and courage to fully resolve. In the meantime, the Diamond War Memorial is now a place where all families connected to those who lost their lives can openly commemorate that sacrifice. The story there of how the people of Derry are remembering their shared history of the First World War. We're going to take a break now and when we come back we'll be finding out how an 80 foot Irish round tower built of Irish limestone ended up in Belgium and how it has become a focal point for all of the Irish who fought in World War One. Bem the rest of a moment. As 1998, that President Mary McAleese and Queen Elizabeth jointly paid tribute to soldiers from the island of Ireland who died. This was the first time that the two heads of state met publicly. It was also the first time that Ireland officially acknowledged Irish soldiers who had served in the British Army. Now, the location for this get-together was the Island of Ireland Peace Park in Flanders, and the inspiration for this park came from a Donegal man and his search for the grave of a young soldier from his parish. And I can't think of anybody better to bring us this story than that man's daughter, our reporter, Mary Hart. An accidental meeting between two men in a remote cottage in Donegal in the 1970s would eventually send one of them on a journey in search of a soldier's grave in the battlefields in France. Well, Marshall Taylor was a personal friend of my grandfather Hart. I was visiting his house uh, accidentally, had no purpose in going there because he, he lived alone. I saw a photograph on the table of a soldier and um, I happened to ask him, who was that? And uh, very emotionally he told me it was his uh, brother who died in the war and became very emotional about it. And I said, well, if I'm ever in France and anywhere conveniently near the grave, I'll leave Fleur in the grave for you. And very emotionally he threw his arms around me and he said, I'd love if you do that. I'd die happy if you do that. It would be some 20 years later when Paddy Hart fulfilled his promise and found the grave of the 21-year-old Donegal soldier. But it was a journey that would also open a new chapter in Irish history. At that grave site, I thought, my God, the number of Irish men who died in the First World War had been gone and forgotten, and this was not right. And I had a guilty conscience about it. That as a member of Don Ireland, I played my part in helping to forget. I thought it was wrong that this generation should forget a man like Henry Taylor. I remember looking around and saying, if I spoke about this in the door, they wouldn't believe me. Nobody would believe me. So, I'm going to now, first of all, get public recognition for it and get a delegation from Don Aaron to come and see for it for themselves, uh, which I did. After that visit, 
plans for a memorial dedicated to the soldiers from the island of Ireland gathered momentum. The Journey of Reconciliation Trust was established and with public and private funding, a site was found in Messines in Flanders. The work on the Island of Ireland Peace Park and Round Tower began. Messines was where the Catholic Irish and the Protestant Irish together fought in the First World War on the same side. On the 11th of November 1998, on the 80th anniversary of Armistice Day, history was made once again on Messines Ridge, when two old enemies came together to remember the 50,000 soldiers from the island of Ireland who never came home. It was also the first formal recognition by the Irish state of those soldiers. I felt very proud. I didn't have to ask them. I think most. Uh, I know uh, President McAleese, uh, I knew her personally, so I didn't have to persuade her. At the time, it didn't seem anyway, nothing extraordinary happened. But looking back on it now, uh, I'm very proud that I was part of it. And um, it's now part of Irish history. In yet another gesture on the pathway to reconciliation between Ireland and Britain, he became the first member of Dáil Éireann to accept an honorary OBE, urging people to leave the politics of yesterday behind. Naturally, I was very happy and proud of it. When I asked my family for advice, they all said the same thing. Well, who would turn it down? When I set out to do what I planned to do, I didn't realise what I was doing, who I was going to meet, and um, how it was all going to be received. I would like to think that my legacy would be that soldiers of the First World War were not forgotten. The Island of Ireland Peace Park, a lasting tribute to those Irish who died on battlefields on the continent of Europe. Well now, tomorrow is Armistice Day and no matter what our thoughts are about war, its rights and its wrongs, it's certainly worth spending a few moments remembering those well over 35,000 Irish men who lost their lives in the war that began 100 years ago in 1914. A yesh day, Gareb Ananam Nacha Ile, Iwagwivanish, Agus Gadeish of Slan.